is so it's such a treat for me to introduce you all to uh, one of the great mentors of my life, Dr. Rigby. Um, I thought maybe a place to start would be with the question that I asked you, uh, because we do want to get into St. George and Otto Farberg and respiration and so on, but would be to start with um, the, the question I asked you before about how many languages do you, do you speak? Um, well, um, people had a talk in Mexico, a, a professor introduced me and said that, that he was fluent in Spanish, and that surprised me because I never thought of myself as being fluent in English even. <laughs> but but uh, at the high altitude, that was 8,500 feet altitude, I, I think I was more fluent. <laughs> <laughs> and you were speaking about your trip and how you got involved with uh, uh, the Russians and uh, CO2. Yeah, in 1968, I, I took a trip to Russia to, to uh, meet some of the professors I had been reading the work of, and uh, it happened that most of them were on vacation all summer, <laughs> and uh, so mostly I, I've uh, depended on, on uh, publications. Uh, the, uh, before 1950, there was quite a bit of uh, Russian literature available in the United States. Uh, my parents and grandparents had uh, some old books that I, I got my introduction to science from these books all the way from 1860 up to uh, fairly recent stuff in homeopathy and natural medicine. And uh, one of the people I, I ran across who was pretty famous back in 1945 or so uh, was J.C. Bose, who was a Hindu uh, physicist who, who studied in England. And uh, he invented the radio in the 1890s and uh, was thinking about the connections between uh, the, the device that he used uh, for receiving radio signals. He, he demonstrated in, in the 1890s uh, uh, setting off a bell across the auditorium, and his receiver was powdered metal uh, with a, uh, an electrical connection, and the radio waves uh, from, for example, just a spark, but he had microwave, uh, uh, millimeter wave uh, transmitters and such. So uh, th they were really very sophisticated, even for present technology. And uh, he would uh, expose these uh, metal powders to radio waves, and they would cohere and conduct electricity. And he naturally was thinking about the sensitivity of uh, organisms in comparison with this uh, powdered physical state of matter. And uh, to resensitize it, he would thump it, had a, a little thing called a decoherer. So as soon as it rang the bell, it would thump itself and become sensitive again. And uh, that kind of thinking, uh, he started arguing that uh, he tried to distinguish the properties of sensitivity that plants and animals have uh, from the, the, uh, the various properties of crystals, rocks, uh, uh, everything he could uh, think of. And he showed that all of the defining features of life uh, could be found in lumps of metal or rock. And uh, he devised a, a a thing that would give a million times amplification, uh, not resolution, but it would show motion amplified by a million times. And you could show that uh, uh, very easily you stimulate a nerve and it twitches. <coughs> uh, most people don't think of nerves as being analogous to muscles, but they do contract uh, when they're stimulated. And if you stimulate them too much, it can even break the nerve fiber by uh, contracting it until it, it can't maintain its fine structure. But he showed that rocks, uh, pieces of metal, would uh, twitch when they were stimulated by, by any means, uh, that uh, mechanical and electrical properties went back and forth both directions. And uh, the English 
physiologists and physicists of the time didn't like that at all. Uh, they, were, they were already uh, getting committed to a mechanistic view of, of biology and neurology. And so he, he went back to India and uh, set up his own research uh, institute there, which is still operating with his name. And uh, I think it was Marconi who, who went to uh, try to get him to develop the, the radio technology uh, many years later. But uh, he, had, he was uh, really about 120 years ahead of his time in, in everything. Mm. I know you wanted to uh, speak uh, in particular, start off in terms of respiration about St. Georgie and uh, Otto Harburg, so maybe you might start with that. Um, in, in, um, when I ran into um, academic biology, I, I realized that, I, that there just wasn't anything happening that seemed intelligent in, in American biology all through the 50s. So, <laughs> Uh, that was when I was going to college, and I decided that I would just read in the library all the science I wanted and uh, major in literature and philosophy and, and linguistics and such. And uh, I, when I was 18, I ran into uh, William Blake in a, a literature course and realized that uh, from the way he used language, uh, he knew stuff about the physiology of the brain, among other things, that uh, started me thinking in that direction. And so I read Swedenborg's work on uh, brain physiology. Again, in the 18th century, he knew stuff that was rediscovered only in the 20th century. But, but Blake was writing about this stuff uh, 200 years too soon. And uh, that helped guide me through the science literature and uh, um, finally, in 1968, I, I decided I could tolerate uh, getting a degree in biology. <laughs> but I had learned you have to be quiet, <laughs> not, not say what you think. <laughs> uh, like uh, one of my professors explained, uh, nerve cells at, and pH meters as both working on the basis of a membrane and all through the 20th century, they talked about uh, the pH glass membrane. But uh, I mentioned that you could get exactly the same pH measurements if you filled your glass membrane <laughs> with mercury instead of acid. And I said, does that mean that the mercury diffuses <laughs> freely through the glass membrane? <laughs> or that when you put two chambers separated by an airspace <laughs> and measure the pH on the outside of one and the solution inside another one. Does that mean that the protons are diffusing through that airspace? And uh, I, I learned that you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I don't want to digress too much, but that sort of leads into a little bit about the, your, your discovery of Gilbert Ling and uh, which yeah, also made a huge difference in my life. Um, my first term uh, in nerve biology, um, there were leading into uh, a major body of work by Gilbert Ling, who uh, came from China in the, the 40s, worked with uh, 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 Rafe Girard at the University of Chicago. On, uh, he, Ling was the one that invented the glass microelectrode. And, uh, he was the, the one who knew how it worked. And in uh, studying cells, he uh, couldn't accept the idea that it was uh, penetrating a membrane to have it, its effect. And he said it was simply a phase contact like the, the um, pH meter. It was a surface effect of the glass, uh, uh, the same as a Leyden, or a Leyden chart, uh, exactly the same surface electrical effect on a cell or pH meter or anything that uh, has an electrical uh, surface. And uh, I, I saw that Gilbert Ling had uh, answered all of the prob 
problems that my professor was talking about, but he had done it in a meaningful, coherent way that, that harmonized with J.C. Bose and others. And uh, um, I, I saw that uh, Albert St. Georgi was uh, uh, doing the same kind of coherent biology, it had nothing to do with membranes. Sensitivity was an intrinsic property of the uh, complex of proteins and other molecules and how they interacted electronically. And I wrote uh, Gilbert Lane and said, uh, am I understanding this right? It looks like you've already solved these problems that people are confused about. He said, well, the problem is you just don't understand what science is. It's about money and prestige. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's never been about that for you, and, and, and which is unfortunate, because uh, Dr. Pete has always been so generous, as he is today, being here. So uh, maybe you want to go further a little bit more with the St. George and Otto Farberg uh, and the whole um, issues about Yeah, I, I wrote to these people uh, because they were doing the stuff that I thought my professors should be doing. and, and uh, uh, St. Georgie, uh, I, I saw, it was related to uh, another uh, respiration physiologist, uh, W.F. Koch. You've heard of the Koch reagent, uh, probably the, um, the cancer treatment that he devised in 1915, 1920, um, that was based on the quinone system. and. Uh, the FDA chased him out of the country because they said that that's a, a toxic molecule and there couldn't be any such thing as a free electron system in a cell. And after he was working in Brazil for years, the ubiquinone coenzyme Q was discovered that doing exactly what Koch said quinones do in cells. And I saw that St. Georgi had based his whole career on on W.F. Koch's work, and Koch had even uh, be, been a, a little bit ahead of Otto Barberg in understanding how respiration works in cells. Uh, uh, Koch didn't concentrate just on the mitochondria. He, he saw the whole system as an electronical, uh, electronic unit uh, that could be tuned up by such things as the quinones. St. Georgi applying W.F. Koch's uh, respiration-oriented work showed that if you put an electron donor of a certain uh, variety into a cell, nothing happened, or an electron acceptor like a quinone, nothing would necessarily happen. But if you put a paired uh, donor and acceptor into the cell, the cell would contract, uh, showing that uh, contraction was an electronic, uh, a matter of uh, donating and accepting electrons within a certain voltage range. And uh, uh, Koch had uh, said that this is uh, what controls respiration and all cell functions. Uh, Gilbert Ling's uh, backup to that view of how cells work, uh, Gilbert Ling called them uh, uh, the cardinal adsorbents, uh, not just the, the quinone system, but anything that affects the system in, in a way that uh, adsorbs to the protein and modifies the way the protein adsorbs other things. And uh, carbon dioxide, calcium, and progesterone were things that Gilbert Ling had worked on. And that started me uh, thinking about uh, what, what is carbon dioxide. And uh, that led into a whole uh, rethinking of, I guess everyone knows the henderson hasselbalch equation and, and how carbon di or, uh, bicarbonate is, is the thing that you focus on to regulate pH and so on. Uh, that was all the way from about 1910 up to the present. Uh, I think probably uh, A.C. Guyton's 
a textbook of medical physiology, I think probably is still teaching that. Uh, but essentially it was shown to be wrong, the whole uh, uh, system of the whole context around the um, focus on bicarbonate as the, the regulator of pH and so on. Um, the the um, Brunstead-Lowry acid is, is the one based on the definition of an acid as a proton donor and the base as a proton acceptor. But there is a whole class of acids and bases which contain no protons. So the theory can't be right. And uh, 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 G.N. Uh, Lewis, at, at the same time that uh, Brunstead Lowry got their idea accepted, partly because they fit it into a, a simple reductionist view of chemistry, uh, uh, Lewis, the Lewis acid looks at electrons and an electron acceptor is a Lewis acid, an electron donor is a Lewis base. And looking at St. Georgie and, and W.F. Koch uh, from the context of how acids and bases really work, uh, you see that carbon dioxide is, well, if you visualize the Koch reagent, uh, his uh, most powerful reagent, instead of being a quinone with, with the uh, double bonded oxygens joined by uh, onto a carbon ring, his reagent that he made by uh, spraying uh, uh, alcohol or methane uh, uh, onto a hot platinum electrode and collecting it in, in water, which produced a purple dye at a very tiny concentration showing free electrons in the system. Um, his reagent was uh, just a, a carbon chain with all of the carbons having a double bonded oxygen. And so if you look at carbon dioxide as the shortest coke reagent, it not only fits into uh, WF Koch's view of how respiration works, but um, it, it explains that the Lewis acid is uh, the carbon atom with its electrons so pulled away under the oxygens that the, the carbon atom is a strong electron acceptor. And so it's instantaneously acidic. It doesn't have to form uh, a carbonic acid. So as the CO2 goes into solution, it, 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 it doesn't go through that sequence of the... Well, it, it, it does eventually, but it, it, that doesn't have to do with its acidity. Uh, if it happens to hit a protein, it works like uh, WF Koch's reagent or uh, ubiquinone. It absorbs to the protein. Cardinal adsorbent means that it's the one with power over other things, but, but still it's the whole system. So progesterone, carbon dioxide, uh, potassium, magnesium, other things stabilize the system in a cooperative way. And if you disrupt one of them, it can trigger a release of all of them. And the ones that can put it back together are the, uh, the powerful cardinal absorbents. And Carbon dioxide and progesterone are in this group of, of the powerful adsorbents that can restore proteins after they've been excited and disrupted. Uh, if you look at the, the Lewis acid effect, pulling electrons out of the protein system, it's what, what said Georgie did with his electron acceptor and donor. You pull electrons out, and if there is a source, uh, the electrons will, will travel through the protein and change its conformation. And in the process of causing the protein to retract its electrons, 
every ionized group is tending to associate with um, other oppositely ionized things, which in, in the physiological solution is likely to be sodium or potassium. Uh, those are the main uh, things that, that are attracted. It's the same thing that works in a, a, a water softener, an ion exchange resin. You put the, um, the charged resin in your stream of water, and uh, it binds to magnesium or calcium. And if you flush it with a big dose of sodium, you can wash off the more strongly absorbed uh, uh, calcium or magnesium or iron or whatever. And in the cell, uh, people have taken pieces of uh, hair, which are obviously dead and have no membrane pumps. Uh, they've, they've washed the hair uh, free of all counter ions. And what's left is a protein with some ionized groups. So it's, it's a weak acid. And they then dip it into serum or any, any mixed solution. And instead of picking up the sodium that's abundant in the serum, the hair will reestablish the uh, high potassium, uh, low sodium arrangement. It, it's a, a bulk ion exchange effect. And when, it's, when you excite the cell, temporarily it loses that property and will pick up sodium momentarily and lose potassium. And they talk about that in terms of membrane <laughs> pumps restoring the balance. But it's, it's the protein. Gilbert Ling, uh, at great <laughs> redundancy, has explained that over and over for about 50 years. And uh, very few physiologists want to get involved in it because his math seems uh, complicated for, for most physiologists who are all ready to committed to the kind of math that A.C. Guyton <laughs> uses, a, a, a simple reductionist sort of thing. Now, uh, in the Buteco, in, in the way in which we kind of look at things from Buteco's standpoint, um, we're looking at the Bohr curve, um, the Bohr relationship. And so uh, maybe I'm not understanding this clearly, but our notion was that the, this in the Bohr relationship that CO2 coming in allows for oxygen to dissociate from the hemoglobin, but it was through this, the Henderson-Hasselbeck equation that we understand why the body continues to operate poorly, in a sense, by over-breathing and getting rid of more CO2. So you're, you're, I think you're saying that that, that that really doesn't quite work that way. Uh, well, there are places where it doesn't work. For example, uh, the textbooks say, well, you must have to lose bicarbonate in your urine if you're going to acidify. Uh, but actually, good experiments show that you don't, in fact, have to lose uh, bicarbonate to acidify. Uh, and uh, it's just bad bookkeeping in, <laughs> in most cases. Uh, they don't look at the total amount of carbon dioxide in the system. For example, if you, if, if you um, heat the bones of an, an average animal or person at sea level, uh, you can uh, drive out maybe 100 liters of CO2 that were, was bound in the bones. But in experiments where they have kept, for example, for submarine studies, they'll keep people five weeks or three months or so in a, a chamber with 1% CO2 in the atmosphere, roughly 30 times the normal amount. And uh, they see ups and downs of the, the bicarbonate uh, doing something. Mm -hmm. But while there are these up and down adaptive reactions happening, they find that there's very little calcium. They're eating calcium-rich food, but their urine has very little calcium, very little bicarbonate in it when they're being uh, really well supplied with carbon dioxide. And uh, after they've been out of the chamber, they keep pouring out bicarbonate and calcium. And if you look at, at people who live 
have uh, 0 0.03 uh, carbon dioxide in the environment uh, through their whole lifespan, they're doing what these uh, subjects were doing when they came out of the chamber. They're losing uh, calcium in their urine constantly, and their bones and other tissues are chronically getting smaller over the decades. But uh, the, the, um, the, just after six weeks in one of these chambers, uh, someone calculated that at that uh, under those conditions, it looks as though the bones must be binding a thousand liters per person, which would mean that you would uh, gain or lose about eight pounds in or out of the carbon dioxide environment. Now, I know that you had uh, mentioned, for example, um, oh, well, that's a great story, so maybe you can tell it. I think it relates to this very directly. And I saw that you, you ought to write a, a, a little book which would be called uh, The Naked Mole Rat and the Bats. Oh, yeah. uh, so maybe you could sort of go with that and give your idea of how come that makes such a difference and maybe the piece about Mexico and the difference between uh, Mexico and, the United, uh, and New York City. Yeah, I, I went to um, study in Mexico when I was 18 uh, and uh, I had a couple of times in, in high school I had gone up maybe 9,000 feet, and I found that I was exhilarated. The closer to the top I got, the more energy I had. And I, the, I, my whole summer in Mexico City, I, I had that same sensation that my brain was clearer and I had more energy. Uh, that, that was, uh, there, there were many things besides that that got me personally involved in uh, thinking about respiration. Uh, one was that uh, when I would swim, my friends who wanted to uh, go down, see how deep they could go, would take a, a rock so they would sink quickly. I would just let out a little of my breath and I would sink like a rock. And I, I was always aware that I apparently, even though I seemed to have a normal amount of fat, <laughs> I. Uh, had to uh, sort of struggle to stay afloat. So I figured that I had very dense bones. And uh, I, I read about a family of mutants who had uh, osteopetrosis, which if it's an extreme form, it can kill you because it, the bones close in on the marrow. But this family uh, just had a moderate form. And they lived in chronic respiratory acidosis because they they couldn't efficiently expel the, the CO2 that they made, and so it made their bones uh, become uh, extremely dense. They call it the marble bone disease. Um, about 
uh, protozoa. And they found that none of the single-celled organisms, even the anaerobes, which can live totally without oxygen, none of them could live without carbon dioxide. If they're making carbon dioxide and you remove it as fast as they make it and don't let them build it up, they can't survive. So uh, that, that gives you a, a, a picture of, of uh, all of us. It raises the question, uh, what's the ideal amount of, of carbon dioxide in the environment? Uh, the uh, Carboniferous period where life and evolution were so abundant, uh, had, uh, I think it was uh, 20 times as much carbon dioxide as, as we have now. And, and the temperature was pretty stable all through those changes of carbon dioxide. Uh, the expansion of uh, vegetation, for example, will reflect infrared light back into space. And so it's sort of like the Earth has a thermostat that will regulate for huge changes in, in CO2. Um, 30 years ago, they discovered undersea vents that miles down in the dark, the density of organisms from bacteria through worms and crustaceans, even eels, the light density is 10,000 to 100,000 times too too dense to uh, account for by solar energy. They're all getting their energy out of this volcanic stuff. There's one called the Champagne vent, which is exuding streams of liquid pure carbon dioxide where these uh, very odd organisms are uh, thriving at a very low oxygen environment, but it, it says that uh, these primitive organisms love the, the most carbon dioxide possible. And um, the, the, um, when you look at, at the lifespan, not only our loss of bone and tissue with aging, but all animals and even plants suffer from a lack of carbon dioxide. If you lower it, even plants uh, won't do well. Uh, Single-celled animals and so on. Um, these quite a few animals have have learned how to optimize CO2 in their environment. Uh, salamanders and frogs, for example, will burrow in the mud. Uh, frogs will uh, leave their nostrils out and breathe as, as the, uh, the, their skin is not losing carbon dioxide anymore when they're buried in the mud. And they gradually load up on carbon dioxide. And uh, they found uh, frogs in uh, cement castings that broke open. <laughs> Decades later, the frogs hopped out. No. And uh, also in the 1940s, uh, yeah. People experimented with, uh, for example, poisoning uh, to death rats or mice with 50% carbon dioxide and uh, keeping them dead for an hour and then reviving them. And they had no brain damage. And uh, giving a, a zero oxygen supply to rats, if they gave them extra CO2, they did, weren't damaged by the absence of oxygen. Uh, so it, for us, like like the primitive organisms, it's more essential than oxygen. The naked roll them all around? Yeah, yeah getting there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hear this story. Um, the, um, uh, there was a whole, it, it, there are all over, all the continents, I think, have, have variations on these, but they're uh, about the size of a big mouse. And mice usually live um, two and a half years maximum, something like that. Uh, the naked mole rats that they've had in labs 
uh, even though they, they weren't in their natural habitat, lived 30 years. And they not only live in burrows, but they close off the entrances to their burrow and uh, keep the uh, oxygen way down, uh, less than half of atmospheric, and the CO2 up around 5 or 6 percent. And uh, so th that's more than the submarine experimenters uh, got, but it, it uh, increased their longevity tremendously. Uh, queen bees live, uh, one calculation was they live 47 times longer than the worker bees. And the worker bees every day go out into the atmosphere <laughs> and uh, they build up many times more free radicals, lipid peroxides in their tissues than the queens because they're out uh, breathing fresh air. The queen is breathing uh, five or six percent CO2 in the hive. And uh, also the, um, the workers eat pollen and get a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids that in the absence of carbon dioxide these things uh, produce the lipid peroxides. And uh, in one experiment people increased the, the CO2 in the tissues three times normal and saw that the normal amount of lipid peroxides went down to zero. themselves and then looking back at the literature and uh, seeing that uh, carbon dioxide protects not only against free radicals, uh, lipid peroxidation. Uh, uh, one group, uh, Kogan is the, the Russian's name who has done a lot of work on the antioxidant effect of CO2. Uh, but uh, quite a few people are now, just the last few years, uh, starting to talk about permissive hypercapnia, where instead of ventilating someone to death, uh, that's the two, or two or three of the most popular ways hospitals kill people, is giving them <laughs> pure <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> uh, when, when people, for example, aren't getting enough oxygen to the brain, they'll give them pure oxygen and then hyperventilate them. And the idea is to shrink their brain. <laughs> Uh, by hyperventilating them because it sh shuts down the blood circulation of the brain. But if they're dying of, of a lack of oxygen <laughs> to the brain, it's not what you want to do. And uh, one of the first experiences I had with uh, carbon dioxide therapy was a person who several times had rushed to the emergency room with uh, stroke symptoms, paralysis and um, I think it was called a transient ischemic attack. Uh, I told him about the Russian research with carbon dioxide and suggested he drink a, a Coke when he had those attacks, and that worked for him. And I mentioned that in a nutrition class, and uh, the, I, I had said soda water, meaning like carbonated water. Uh, but the next week, one of the students said that uh, uh, she had interpreted as baking soda in water, oh. which basically the same idea, but uh, she said she gave a spoonful of baking soda to her, her mother who had been uh, half paralyzed for six months. And 15 minutes after drinking just a glass of baking soda water, the paralysis lifted and, and stayed away. And uh, <laughs> that's, uh, they're doing that sort of thing now just by not ventilating people to death as is the, the typical hospital practice. 
Wasn't there a time when firemen had the CO2 added? Uh, yeah, Yandel Henderson, who uh, he, he's the one that quoted uh, Friedrich Mischer, the guy who discovered nucleic acids in, or was one of the early researchers in 1865. Uh, Mischer, uh, besides uh, working on, on nucleic acids, uh, was a person who uh, realized that you could cure shock with carbon dioxide. And uh, Yandel Henderson. Septic shock, for example, uh, anything that causes the, the loss of uh, circulation. Uh, instead of giving them oxygen, you would give them carbon dioxide. And, and uh, Yandel Henderson knew about this work 50 years before his time. And in the, the 20s and 30s, uh, Henderson uh, devised systems with 5%, uh, sometimes 7% or even 10% carbon dioxide. Uh, the five percent mixture in oxygen is now called carbogen, but uh, he had uh, fire departments all over the United States and a lot of hospitals using five percent uh, carbon dioxide for starting babies breathing and uh, treating shock cases. And uh, a bit right after the Second World War, when uh, several factors came in. Uh, that went out. Uh, medicine became purely reductionist and, and mechanical and mistaken after about 1945. Was it used post-operatively too within the Germans to something? Oh, it, like it's, that, yeah? yeah, now uh, a few people are, are using it. Uh, I, uh, a friend's grandfather, uh, 94 years old, had uh, become sick. He, he wanted to travel around the continent. He went to uh, Munich, I think, and uh, spent four days getting what they called carbon dioxide therapy in the hospital and went back and resumed his trip around the world. <laughs> now that reminds me also, I'm sorry, uh, we have a lot of people who want to ask some questions. Uh, this, yes, uh, Amy and then, then can you, Patrick. Can you talk a little bit about carbon dioxide and hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have a, a friend who had been using hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and uh, I was talking about the carbon dioxide and, and the essentiality of that. And uh, so he added some. He didn't have good regulators, but he had a, a cancer patient was the first one he tried it on with. Uh, uh, he had been unable to talk for uh, several weeks because the cancer was very far advanced. And uh, he added a few percent of carbon dioxide to the hyperbaric chamber. And uh, he said the window steamed up <laughs> so he couldn't see what was happening. And I uh, lost contact with the guy and was afraid he, he wasn't uh, communicating. So he had anesthetized him. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, when he opened the chamber, uh, the sheet around him was saturated with water. Uh, it is not only a diuretic, but it, it uh, caused him to vaporize huge amounts of water. And he could talk as soon as he came out of the chamber. Uh, it had taken the edema out of his tumors. Do you have any idea about the mechanism of that, of how carbon dioxide under pressure would work? The same as, as just increasing the concentration, I think. Uh, it's, it just makes the, gets it into your tissues faster. But it's, uh, whatever the conditions, it's still going to equilibrate into your bones and other tissues. And uh, all of your tissues go through that uh, adapting process. You'll, you'll change the proteins, loading them up with carbon dioxide, and that makes them have a higher affinity for potassium and progesterone and so on. Then you'll that'll induce new protein synthesis to suit the situation. And so it, it's a fairly prolonged thing to adapt, and no one really knows how long the ideal adaptation is. But uh, I've seen people just by breathing in a paper bag uh, a few times a day 
bring their blood pressure down 30 points and, and keep it there just in two or three days. Yeah, there's a group in um, the Institute for the Achievement of Human Potential in Philadelphia, Glenn Doman, masks these kids who are brain damaged and it creates a tremendous change in glial cell activity and they're really recovering much more rapidly just masking because he masks himself too so he keeps his memory. Well, um, there was another animal that I didn't mention, the bat. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, bats like to live in, in caves and have a fairly high carbon dioxide environment uh, and they physiologically have a very intense metabolic rate so they're producing it uh, even when they're hanging in their cave, they're still uh, adjusted to this high tissue and serum level of carbon dioxide. And uh, people have banded them over the years, and someone found a banded dead bat that had been, they didn't know how old it was when they put the band on, but it was banded 42 years previously. <laughs> It has a physiology of basically a rat, a mouse yeah, that's yeah. A, that lives about what, two to three years also. Yeah. Bats don't have arthritis. Bats don't have arthritis. I didn't know that, yeah. but uh, uh, I, once I was carrying a, a big tank of uh, carbon dioxide, and I was aware that the, the valve apparatus, if it happened to break, it would be like I was holding a rocket. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, uh, I tripped on the steps, and as I fell, I knew I didn't want to drop that thing and, and then knock off the, uh, the valve. So I went down with it and landed on top of my hands, uh, the weight of my body and, and the tank. And uh, my hand immediately started swelling and turning blue. and. I immediately got a, a plastic bag and, and uh, put my, my hand in a bag of pure CO2. And in 15 or 20 minutes, it looked like a fresh hand, except for some scraped up pieces of skin. And I told that experience to some friends who had arthritis of the knees. And they put their, their legs in a, a bag of pure CO2 and, and uh, relieved the arthritis just in an hour or two. What happened to the mic? Lost the mic. mic there. Oh. oh. Um, Patrick? Uh, I have a question as regards the administration of CO2 in infants. You, you, you mentioned earlier, I'm sure they were breathing in some shape or form. And my question is, if, if you administer a higher level of CO2, then the organism is able to tolerate, will it not induce breathlessness and breathe out the CO2 again? Um, it it um, stimulates its own production. Uh, when you, um, I, I used to, it, it, when I was talking about the effects of polyunsaturated fats and thyroid and estrogen on respiration, I would concentrate on the electron transport chain and the cytochrome oxidase enzyme, which is, under the influence of thyroid or altitude, you increase the amount of, of uh, not only of total mitochondrions, but of the, uh, especially the cytochrome oxidase enzyme, which is what uses oxygen and governs your rate of oxygen consumption, how much of that enzyme you have and how active it is. And when you saturate a cell with a very large amount of, of CO2, you activate, uh, chronically you increase the number of mitochondria, but fairly quickly you increase the amount of the cytochrome oxidase enzyme and increase its activity almost instantly. The first thing you see is that the whole oxidative balance of the cell is increased towards the oxidized state, pulling electrons out of the system. Uh, uh, diabetics in the cytoplasm of a, a normal person, you'll have a ratio of five or 600 NADs to each NADH. When you're, uh, if you plug up the um, cytochrome oxidase, as in Barberg's 
idea of what happens in cancer and start running on increased lactic acid formation, the NAD is being consumed in making lactic acid. And although this pours lactic acid out into the system as a, a hormone of stress and uh, toxic inflammatory effects, it leaves the NADH in excess so that where normal you have a ratio of NAD to NADH of several hundred uh, to one, uh, a diabetic who is, or a person with cancer has uh, a reduced amount of NAD because the uh, NADH is being increased uh, in forming lactic acid and the pH inside the cell increases during lactic acid formation. Uh, if you look at the, the equation of forming lactic acid and using uh, up your niacin uh, cofactor, uh, you see why it increases the pH of the, of the cell for the lactic acid to be produced and leaving. And uh, so the um, several effects of the carbon dioxide shut off glycolysis and it also shuts off lipolysis. It, a diabetic uh, is forced to use increased amounts of fat and free fatty acids poison the mitochondrion so they can't respire as in the Barber effect of what constitutes cancer, the defective mitochondria, and especially the cytochrome oxidase. So you're turning off the, the crucial thing in, in Barber's cancer explanation, turning off the lactic acid excess production. At the same time, you're increasing the cytochrome oxidase and uh, shifting the balance of the cell so that uh, the diabetics or cancer patients will have uh, much lower ratios of, of available NAD uh, and just by looking at their, the ratio of NAD to NADH you can see that, that diabetes and uh, degenerative diseases generally have an over reduced cytoplasm and the um, stressed system besides being reduced that means it's got more electrons than it should have. This makes the whole system have, in the sense of uh, alkaline things as being electron donors, it shifts the whole system's pH towards the alkaline direction. And that is involved in loading up the system with water. Um, uh, if you um, put acid in, in a a gelatin solution, it excretes water. If you alkalinize it, you puff it up. Uh, so it's just a, a physical effect that water is attracted towards the electron-rich polymer. So carbon dioxide is changing the, the water economy of the cell. Uh, it's a physical arrangement which affects the enzyme glycolysis and uh, respiration, and you're actually increasing the uh, all of the aspects of the oxidized condition of the cell, uh, pulling the, the electrons out of the system, in effect, at the same time that you're activating the oxygen as the ultimate electron acceptor. Uh, so um, you, if you want to uh, uh, damage the respiratory apparatus, uh, you can cut off the oxygen without supplying the CO2 or with, if you make too much lactic acid <coughs> available, uh, the same thing happens. The lactic acid displaces CO2, so you, are, you hyperventilate when you make uh, too much lactic acid. And if you hyperventilate, you make too much lactic acid. So like just driving on the freeway, 
you probably <laughs> are shifting your balance uh, by hyperventilating in the mechanical sense, and that pulls the cells in the direction of making lactic acid, which keeps the stress system going. Now, at higher altitudes, like again, for example, in Mexico City versus like New York City, we have you know much more pollution in Mexico City, and yet the rate of asthma there is lower than it is in New York City. Yeah, and Mexico City is much more polluted than, than most of the U.S. cities, and the kids who grew up there very seldom have asthma, but if they go down to Acapulco where the air is very clean coming in fresh off the ocean, uh, a lot of them get asthma attacks going down where there's more oxygen. Uh, and the oxygen excess seems to be the, the big thing. So it's the oxygen access, excess, not the, the difference in terms of the tension at the higher levels? Well, it, it, yeah, it's uh, uh, the oxygen is pushing the CO2 out of your system. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm you plastic bag full of carbon dioxide for a while, and I'd like you to explain that process a little oh, more. Um, many years ago, uh, people studying uh, hot spring baths, you know, people have known about carbonated uh, baths of the natural sort for thousands of years. Uh, already in Europe, in the 18, in the 1700s, there were several big companies, uh, Schweppes, and uh, a Hungarian company, a Swedish company, a German and, and English companies were already uh, bottling carbonated water from their springs. And that was uh, uh, Joseph Priestley, the guy famous for oxygen. Uh, he, was, he was one of the first people to devise a way to artificially carbonate water, making a, a, a tonic, a, a drug product, essentially. Um, but the, um, the Japanese, I think, were the pioneers in doing the physiology of how bathing in carbonated water works. And the, the reasoning is you can only get a certain amount of carbon dioxide into warm water, and the body already has more carbon dioxide than that. So what the mechanistic idea is, if you have a membrane and things always go down gradients, you must be losing carbon dioxide into the water even when it's carbonated. But the Japanese found that it actually goes into your body up the the <laughs> so-called chemical gradient, um, as if it's being pumped in, but it's it's because, like the bones can can store <laughs> thousand liters per person, uh, all of your tissues. Uh, other people have experimented with storing meat in carbon dioxide, and, and just just a, a chunk of muscle, dead muscle can uh, store a huge amount of carbon dioxide. Uh, and it's the same thing that happens in the Bohr effect. On hemoglobin, the carbon dioxide uh, makes the hemoglobin as a unit a little more acidic by retracting the electrons. And that's just enough to make the oxygen uh, a little less sticky to the, uh, the protein. But in uh, uh, the whole body has this affinity for carbon dioxide uh, um, that binds strongly enough to pull it right out of the water. And it can be in the form of bicarbonate or uh, carbon dioxide gas. It still flows up the gradient into your body. And the, the main thing seems to be the carbamino formation on lysine and other amino groups in proteins uh, that works in the, the Bohr effect. But we're made of uh, proteins that are rich in lysine and other amino groups. And even the nucleic acids uh, contain some amino groups. Uh, 
that uh, physically just are going to have to associate with uh, carbon dioxide. And uh, the, um, when you look at, at uh, protein hormones, for example, pituitary hormones, if you really pay attention to a given hormone, uh, like you call it growth hormone or, or prolactin or whatever, it's really a family of substances and that their composition will change and their function will change according to how much carbon dioxide that they're exposed to because all of them have some lysine or other amino containing uh, proteins, uh, amino acids, and um, when the carbamino group is formed, instead of uh, being an amino in contact with the water, it's uh, this more acidic uh, carbonyl, uh, carbon dioxide bound under the uh, amine. And uh, the so-called receptors in the cells that respond to each of these hormones. The hormones change according to the CO2 they've been exposed to, and the receptors also get uh, carbon, carbamino uh, groups formed on them. Uh, and just a few people have been studying that, but it means that insulin, for example, there's a difference between carbamino insulin and plain insulin. They aren't the same hormone and the so-called insulin receptors are uh, carbonated or not, and they behave very differently. So just looking at the concentration of a, a simple hormone, you can't interpret it until you know how carbonated the cell is. And then the carbonated hormone is going to be different in relation to the carbonated cell. How do we get ourselves <laughs> uh, you can buy just big, big uh, like a leaf bag, and just fill it up. Uh, fill it up with, with, with the gas. Yeah, uh, you just at a welding shop, you can uh, squeeze all the air out and then fill the bag up. And uh, you have to hold. It's heavy. You can feel the weight of it. Uh, and if you hold it up once it's full and climb over the edge so you don't spill it, and then you close it up. As soon as it touches your skin, you can feel it's, it's uh, hot because it's causing vasodilation. This is the gas, the, set, the gas itself that's in the bag? Yeah. yeah. It's heavy, so it stays down. Uh, so Anna, you, you wanted to, you had a question. Yes, I did. Um, so when you first were talking, Dr. Pete, um, gosh, I'm trying so hard to stay, <laughs> stay with you here. Um, and you mentioned that Henderson has a block, but uh, probably is not a valid uh, theory anymore. And, and, and I have used that in my talks about the Botego and CO2 well, and yeah, acid. Yeah. But, but what you, is it true what you're saying that it's, am I getting it right, what you're saying is that it's more related to these, uh, these proteins and the carbon aminos? And would, would you just clarify that for me, please? Yes, the carbon dioxide directly acidifies not only the, the, the um, hemoglobin in the red cell, but it acidifies your whole system and makes the cell have a greater affinity for oxygen. So it's causing the cells to pull oxygen in as well as driving it off the red cell. And the, the uh, where, where the Henderson Hasselbalch goes goes wrong in the worst way is is uh, how kidneys behave. Uh, if you look up Peter A. Stewart's uh, it, the strong ion difference is uh, what is the first substitute for the Henderson e equation. Um, Thirty years ago, uh, he uh, said. Uh, what is the role of bicarbonate in acid-base regulation? He said, simply, none. 
But he was only talking about the blood, really, and not about cells. So he's only sort of halfway there. Uh, you have to think about the, how the cell is being made more eager for oxidative processes when it's well carbonated. And uh, the, you, can, you can approach the carbonation for example, with pregnenolone or progesterone, uh, you're, you're contributing to pushing the balance in that way so that that hormone will make the cell have a greater affinity for carbon dioxide. And estrogen does the opposite. Instantly, estrogen, within uh, two or three minutes, you can see the cell begin to take up water and begin to make lactic acid poisoning the respiratory system. Um, so there's a balance between estrogen and progesterone uh, and, and how that pulls water and, and pulls water out and puts CO2 in. Yeah, one of the most popular books that was built on a lot of Dr. Pete's work, um, but sort of really not only popularized it, but I think kind of, you know, uh, brought it down a bit is uh, by John Lee, um, uh, you know, the, the book called uh, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About uh, Menopause, but there's been, it's much more um, well explicated by Dr. Pete's book, book it's, uh, himself, which is uh, from menopause. Uh, from PMS to menopause. Yeah, uh, which is also. The name of your book is PMS? From PMS to menopause, uh, female hormones in context. Yeah. Uh, I just, I'm sorry, I want to make sure we cover two other things, and if we have some time, I'll be, come back to you. I'd be glad to. But because um, uh, most people are not aware of the relationship between th thyroid hormone and CO2, so would you just speak a little bit about that? Um, besides the thing I mentioned about the rabbit bones uh, being overdeveloped in, in the presence of either uh, carbon dioxide or, or um, thyroid, uh, there have been many experiments using just T3, the active thyroid hormone, uh, in uh, mouse skull bones, which you can grow in a culture dish. And they showed that uh, T3 very quickly stimulates respiration and uh, the um, deposit of uh, uh, calcium carbonate as the new bone. Uh, new bone is, is calcium carbonate rather than calcium phosphate. And uh, the, the um, as I, I said, the uh, cytochrome oxidase is is uh, what thyroid acts on primarily. So it it's I think its main thing is to increase the production. Of, of CO2 and the affinity for oxygen, and uh, that ends up suppressing lactic acid formation and uh, doing the opposite of what estrogen and polyunsaturated fats do to your respiratory system. Oh, and one other whole system that I, I didn't mention that, that causes biochemical hyperventilation, in other words, the production of lactic acid instead of carbon dioxide, is uh, the endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide from bacterial activity in the intestine. Um, under stress, uh, the circulation to the intestine is reduced, and it becomes more permeable, more endotoxin gets into the bloodstream. And uh, it, once it gets past the liver, it releases uh, the inflammatory cytokines, nitric oxide and uh, tumor necrosis factor and such, that work with estrogen as an anti-respiratory adaptation. Uh, and uh, anything that slows your liver function, such as low thyroid, will let more endotoxin get into your bloodstream and let more estrogen remain there. 
and both of these in turn uh, lower your CO2 production and thyroid function. And so it can be a vicious circle that starts just with, with stress or eating something wrong. Uh, we, uh, no, go ahead. Studies on rats, and they show that estrogen has a great protective mechanism for the brain to maintain a healthy, healthy brain in rats. Estrogen? Uh -huh. Well, uh, the rats that receive estrogen have much healthier brains um, than those that don't. In the fifties and sixties, there were studies in which uh, estrogen or insulin uh, would be given to one group, at, and while they measured brain metabolism and growth. And they saw that either estrogen or insulin would stop brain growth completely, where uh, by lowering blood sugar was what they were studying at the time. But estrogen lowers uh, oxygen availability, and, and insulin lowers glucose availability. And so those are essential for brain growth. And, um, but it makes the rats smarter? Uh, no. Uh, the old rats smarter than the Well, no, what it does, it. Um, the um, O-methyl uh, uh, O-methylation of brain transmitter substances uh, is this process is blocked by estrogen, so that you accumulate it acts like a, a, a an adrenaline or, or a brain transmitter accumulator. The estrogen has a toxic effect on the detox enzyme system that should lower your brain transmitters. Uh, and cocaine and the estrogen have almost identical effects uh, on this enzyme system, acting like an antidepressant or the cocaine effect, which is an excitant. So uh, cocaine is really a safer a solution to increasing brain activity than estrogen because <laughs> uh, estrogen has these liver and thyroid uh, suppressive effects and increases vascular permeability and uh, a tendency to blood clot and so on. Uh, so it's it's a very risky way to increase your <laughs> your brain function. Somebody just ran out and they're going to have a bunch of cake cocaine available for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, final thing I, I wanted to, um, you know, just have uh, one mention because this is someone again that hardly any of you, certainly not myself, will have heard of and that's just a, a moment about uh, Mei Wan Ho. Oh, um, she has a website, uh, ISIS, but if you look up her name, M-A-E-W-A-N-H-O. Uh, she, for example, has has put worms under a geological polarizing microscope and demonstrated that you can see uh, coherent polarization streams through the uh, the worm. Uh, her book is, I think, called "The Worm and the Rainbow." Rainbow, Rainbow and the worm. Rainbow. And. Uh, I got interested in, in her work when I was in Mexico, in Michoacan. They used to uh, catch their fish and lay them out in the market on a newspaper or a magazine or something, and you could read the fine print through a fish the size of a trout, uh, just like a lens. Uh -huh. uh, when you cooked them and ate them, they had bones and blood vessels and organs and so on, but in the living state, you could see right through it like glass. And uh, the only way to explain that is that uh, photons are behaving in a, a way that is very hard to explain, but may one always work. She sees the body as a liquid, as a liquid crystalline. Yeah. The fluid system is a crystal. It's uh, an ever-changing crystal. Solko Tromp, uh, T-R-O-M-P, wrote a book called Psychical Physics. I think about 1940, but uh, the, the, in the 30s, uh, the idea of life as a liquid crystal was already catching on. And that was just one of the things that in the late 40s got knocked out by a standard reductionist medicine. The work of Gerald Pollack, 
who really believes that the water of the body, you know, as opposed to Bruce Lipton who's thinking membranes, Pollock is talking about the liquid crystal as the controlling factor of uh, the movement of, of uh, yeah. metabolic, metabolic metabolites to the system. Yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, going in the right direction. Uh, so, yeah. Gilbert, Gilbert Ling uh, has the, the fine details on how it works. <laughs> GilbertLing.org is his website. Well, Dr. Pete, is there any final comments that you would like to, you know, sometime we, we, we could go on for hours and hours and years, actually, uh, but is there any, uh, something that you felt like you would like to say to this group in terms of your life experience and, and some so sharing your own sense of wisdom about what you might say to us? Um, uh, well, the, um, for people in alternative holistic uh, health interests, uh, carbon dioxide is really a a good thing to focus on because uh, it's, if you think of context as being what's missing from a reductionist medicine, uh, every life process, uh, carbon dioxide is a context that you have to uh, take into account. And if you look at any tissue or organ or system in any kind of organism, the way carbon dioxide behaves in that organ or system is going to be a model for the way carbon dioxide works in other systems. So uh, your heart and brain, uh, same thing if you are hyperventilating, your heart blood vessels close off, metabolism goes bad, and you get heart pains or heart attack, clotting and so on. Uh, same thing, uh, clotting or transient ischemia uh, spasms in brain, uh, just, just simple carbon dioxide will cure uh, or prevent uh, the most drastic sort of biological events. And thinking of it, it as the, the context for, for interpreting uh, physiology across organ systems, uh, you have a, a good fence against the uh, basically silly arguments that the the standard medical people make against thinking physiologically uh, because their their physiology is always uh, applicable only up to a, a certain limit in a very nar narrow range. Um, I think we're about, is that, yeah, we're, we're going to have to finish. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pete. It's just an absolute pleasure. <laughs>